Welcome back to the Globetrotters podcast, the show that brings you diverse storytelling, thoughtful discussions on ethical issues, and investigations into how you can make the most of an adventure without breaking the bank. I'm your host, Jonathan Otero. If you tuned in last week, we held another edition of the Layover series, our bi-monthly travel show in which we investigate all things travel, update you on the latest travel news, and occasionally, we'll look into a questionable travel ten so you don't have to. On today's episode, we'll speak to Ali Case, the founder and CEO of Uppercase Media, a marketing agency that focuses on social media management in the health and wellness space and food and beverage. Ali is also a part-time flight attendant. On this podcast, we rarely get the opportunity to talk to someone who serves travelers in addition to being one herself. This episode focuses on learning more about the lifestyle of a flight attendant, the unique perks that make this a desirable job for travel junkies, and the evolution of air travel as we navigate it through a pandemic. Ali, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Our pleasure. Ali, before we get into it, we got a little bit of a playful but burning question our listeners want to ask you the most. As a crew member, does the middle seat passenger get prior- priority over one or both of the armrests? <laughs> I love this question because you might have seen that video that went viral recently from a pilot yeah. talking over the PA and he's like, the person in the middle gets both armrests. <laughs> so that's, that's definitely sparked a lot of conversation recently. Um, you know what? The middle seat is kind of like the worst seat. So I'd say give them, <laughs> give them both, give them both on red. <laughs> yeah, definitely the worst of the two options. And I, I don't know about you. Are you more aisle or window? I was just talking about this with a friend coming back from our trip yesterday. If it's a short flight, I like the window because I like to just be like undisturbed. But if it's a longer flight, I like the aisle. So I have easy access to like get up, go to the bathroom and not have to disturb anyone. <laughs> we are two in the same, same thing. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about travel etiquette. What are some of the do's and don'ts that you would advise travelers to consider before boarding their next plane? That's a great question. I would say for do's, definitely preparation, I think is key. Like having everything that you need handy and like your personal items so that you're not having to like get up a million times during the flight to grab your laptop to grab your water to grab this so like kind of having the things you know you'll need in flight with you close by under the seat in front of you or in the seat pocket and then um stowing your larger bag up up away because you know you won't have to access that and then i feel like that kind of falls under a do and don't <laughs> in one. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you off the hook for this one. Okay, well, she, I'll, I'll, I'll count that as both a do and a don'ts. Um, Ali, I'm a big fan of stats. So here are a few relating to the demographics of flight attendants that you may already be aware of, or maybe not. Um, according to CIPIA, there are over 90,000 flight attendants currently employed in the United States, 79% of which are women. Despite this large difference in gender ratio, Women earn 95 cents for every $1 earned by men before anyone gets up in arms, which, you know, this is actually better than the national average across all industries in which women earn 82 cents for every dollar a man makes. That was one stat that jumped out of me. And we could talk all day about the gender wage gap, but the second stat, stat that jumped out at me was the average career length of airline crew members. Roughly 74% of all flight attendants last less than five years. And so my question is this, Ali, you've been working as a flight attendant for four, approaching that five-year mark, which means you're in the minority of people who have stuck it out for this long or about to. Why do you think people last long or short in this industry? Wow. I'm actually, I'm surprised to hear that stat too. I thought it would be the opposite, that more people would stay. And I think a pro of staying would be that your seniority accrues. So it's definitely like the longer you're with the company, the better your schedule gets, the higher your pay is, the more, um, the, the better time you can schedule your days off. You can choose to just work trips to Rome instead of Toledo and things like that. Um, and then I would say maybe, yeah, that's, I would assume that, I would have assumed that most people would stay longer, but I could also see a lot of people as well 
just wanting to try it for a few years because it is one of those industries that you can kind of pop into for a few years in between careers or after school or really just any time and try something new, travel the world for free for a few years, get in, get out, do your thing. So definitely I could see I could see both sides playing, um, having, having their pros and cons of like staying longer or, or just doing it for the experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was equally surprised two things that I want to say about that one I think it was 8% of the workforce falls between the ages of 20 to 30 years. So flight attendants are tend to be on the older side. I think the percentage is about 74% of them are 40 years or older. Has that been your experience and what you see in, in every day uh, working in this industry? I would say it's definitely a mix. And I think a lot over the last few years, especially after COVID, when there was a little bit of a hiring freeze for all airlines, the hirings picked up again. So we're seeing a lot of junior flight attendants coming to all these different bases, which is great because it's bumping up my seniority, my schedules and trips are getting better. So I'm like, keep them coming. Um, but so I'm seeing definitely a, lot, a mix um, of new hires, but the new hires do vary in age. I see some new hires that are 20, some new hires that are 40, and they're just looking for something different, or maybe they were a flight yeah. attendant in their 20s, they quit, now they're back. But you do start at the bottom again, whatever your age is. Yeah, I think the average age was actually 41 for flight attendants, uh, which was, again, another eye-popping stat considering everything we talked about. But... Interesting, right? Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about you, though. Why did you get into this line of work and what has kept you going? So my, I have an aunt that has been a flight attendant for, I want to say it's been 37 years or something really, really long like that. And I always grew up with stories of her telling me about her just day in the life as a flight attendant, which oftentimes involved a quick trip to Beijing for a few days. And she'd That's be like, nice. I know, so casual. And she'd be like, do you guys want anything? I'm going to be in Beijing. Then I'm going to be in London next week. And I was like, what in the world? You're going to all these cool places. You're getting paid to go. This is your life. So I always just from a really young age, was really interested in that work side. And I always thought I was like, no matter what I do, maybe I'll just like try to be, I'll, I'll apply. Maybe I'll be a flight attendant for a year travel the world, experience it. And I, I thought I was going to be a, a get in, get out type of person. And um, so it originally started, I was working in marketing for a startup in Los Angeles. I started working there when I was 19 and then was there for two and a half years. But towards the end of staying there, I really just like, I just wanted to travel. And I was having, as, as a startup, it's a little tough to be like, can I vacation every week all the time? Unless you're like working for yourself or you are in the travel industry or something like that. So I started, eventually I transitioned out of the marketing role I was in. It was in marketing, wholesale, social media, PR, small team. So everyone was doing a lot of everything. And um, I started freelancing and was like, this is the perfect time that I can go become a flight attendant. I'll apply, I'll go through the process and I'll do both of them. And I can do the freelance on the go, kind of be my own boss, but also be able to travel the world for free. And I was like, and then I'll figure it out from there. But I fully intended to just do it for one year. <laughs> so, so, I mean, maybe that's where that statistic comes from, right? That a lot of people drop before the five years because they might go into it with that mindset and something a lot something makes them something keeps them going uh but but you brought up something that i wanted to talk about you said your love of travel kind of influenced your decision to become a, a flight attendant i know it's not a prerequisite for the job per se but would you say that most of your colleagues are travel enthusiasts absolutely and i think what i see from the friends that i have that have quit or they've moved on to different roles um, in different industries or um, just move away from the airline industry and from flying so much is when they lose their kind of like passion for travel. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of friends that, um, the, the friends that I have that have quit, they have kind of like gotten to the point where they're like, oh, I haven't really used my travel benefits in like six months. I visited my brother, but other than that, and then it's like those people that tend to just like drift off. And I think it's cause a lot of the times you join the travel industry specifically in a role like a flight attendant 
for the flight benefits. Like you're not necessarily doing it for the money. You're doing it because you want to travel for free. You want the flexibility and you like being on the go. So once that starts, stops being exciting and lighting that spark, I think that's when people tend to tend to drop off. Losing their travel spark. Not something I can empathize with yet. Hopefully it doesn't hit me. It doesn't sound like it's hit you yet. Um, but one last thing I want to talk about this, this topic is burnout. Do you ever experience it? I mean, it is a very demanding job and we will talk about the perks later on, but in respect to burnout, is that common, um, along, uh, for, for flight attendants? Absolutely. And I think that also goes hand in hand with kind of the spark thing as well, is that if you're traveling so much for work and you're day to day is like in your like you're spending all day on an airplane and you're doing the drinks and you're doing the quick layovers and all the things it makes it tough when you're getting back home to want to go take a trip because you're like oh i'm home for three days do i go to europe or do i stay home and in a lot of cases you're like i just want to relax for three days so it starts to become a little more work than than vacation so i think to kind of get that perfect balance is to each their own for sure but um definitely the burnout i think comes from when you're working so much you kind of want to stay home on the days that you have off versus go travel some other places um so i would say burnout is definitely common i'm in a position which i'm very thankful for that i'm very what i deem a part-time flight attendant so i fly basically the least amount of hours that i can fly to still keep my benefits and all the things and um and then I also have my marketing agency, Uppercase Media, as well. So I kind of can take that on the go. So I work my my work trips, and then I come home, spend some days at home, and then I still feel energized enough to go work abroad somewhere else, which is really cool. And, and you know, a good analogy for that is like the chef who's cooking all day at a restaurant and prepping, and then if you have to come home and then cook for yourself or your family, it gets a little bit, you know, daunting or exhausting. But since you brought up the minimum hours required, let's talk about a little bit more about the technical aspects of your job. What is the minimum required for a quote unquote part time flight attendant? And what would deem you full time? And what are some of the perks and cons of of either? So I think it varies airline to airline, okay. because I think some maybe don't have a specific minimum or maybe the the minimum just varies, but with my airline, it is 40 hours of a minimum, so 40 hours per month. Okay. So I tend to sit around like 45 to 55 hours. And I would say a general, like an average line would be about 80 hours. So I'm working about half of what a, a typical flight attendant schedule would look like. But there are also opportunities to work high, high time is what we call it. We call it high time. And you could work 130 hours being like, oh top top which is like a lot but it's it's funny because it's not like a traditional like 40 hour work week because you're really you're only getting paid while the boarding doors close so it's like you could be at the airport all day for like 12 hours one day but it's only five hours that you're getting paid for so it's those like paying hours that it counts as if that makes sense so 130 hours to someone would be like that's like kind of normal but like that's like actually working every single day no weekends it's a lot of that's a that's high time And I think an important distinction to make is that it's not your traditional 40 hour job week where you're getting assigned your schedule ahead of time, depending what your role is. Um, I think there's something that you discussed with me last time. It's you can technically bid to uh, sign up for a shift. How does that work? Yeah, so it depends on, it's kind of like split into two sectors. There's a reserve flight attendant and a line holder flight attendant. And the reserves are typically the newer hires so like when you join you're typically on reserve for a year straight and depending on the airline you might be on reserve for a few years and in that case you're given before the month starts you're given your days off so you know like i'll be home these 12 days everything else is a wash you could be anywhere at any time on any of those other days other days similar to like being a nurse on call or something like that except instead of like going to a hospital you're like being whisked away overseas or to like the neighboring state for who knows how long and at what time in the middle of the night you're called for it. And um, and then as a line holder, you can kind of bid specific trips. So you can say like, oh, my brother lives in Austin and I want to be there on his birthday on September 5th. I'm going to bid for an Austin layover. You can kind of bid that way. And then how Very it's cool. awarded to you, it's really, really cool. And how it's awarded to you is um, based off of seniority. So if there's a lot of people bidding for that specific layover, it's going to kind of go in 
seniority base or um, in seniority order. So like if I tried to start bidding for Rome every week, the system, it would never get to me because I've only been flying for four years. And I think you'd be flying for like 30 years to have that trip. So um, that's a, it's a really cool way of like on reserve, you can bid your days off, but it's a little more up in the air about where you're going. What would be the advantages of bidding for like, let's say a shorter flight, like if you're bidding to, you know, you're currently based in Florida, right? So if you were going Miami to Orlando and vice versa multiple times a day versus going Miami to Los Angeles, not just in terms of the job, but also like the wear and tear on your body. I don't know how invested you have to be on those shorter flights versus multiple shorter flights versus one long flight. That's a great question. And I think it it depends on the type of person because for myself, I would prefer to work three short flights and go to like Orlando and then do like a Havana turn or something like where they're like less than an hour flights, like yeah. two, 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 and do like three quick flights, then do Miami to LA. And there's so many other flight attendants that would be like, I hate doing three flights a day. I'd rather just do the one and done. And it just totally depends. I, I just way prefer like the, the quick, like it kind of keeps it like, exciting when you're on like Miami LA is I mean could be almost six hours depending yeah. on you know the wind and, and all the things and you know that can get a little boring sometimes I mean you could read in flight but I kind of like it to be a little quicker pace of like we're up and now we're down so it definitely depends on on the person yeah I mean I didn't I didn't think about that right like it may I'm sure the shift goes by a lot faster when you're constantly on your feet for that one one and a half hour flight doing that multiple times versus the amount of downtime that you would have Miami to LA or Miami to Europe um very interesting uh Definitely. if it's a European trip I'll take it <laughs> if it's the I'm like by the time I get from like Miami to LA I could be like Miami to Europe I'm like I'll take the I'll take the European trips any day over the three short flights. <laughs> and and you know I think another thing that's unlike other jobs is that there's a mandatory rest period in between taking these flights. Can you talk a little bit more about that and educate our listeners because it's still not clear to me how it works. Yeah, so the FAA, I think it's the FAA requirement, um, is that we need a minimum of 10 hours of rest, which also was just updated as of like the last, I want to say the last year. It okay. used to be eight hours, which is so wild to think that you could like potentially work like a 15 hour day and then have eight hours to like rest, shower, change and be at the airport, like yeah. all in that eight hour period and then be on the next flight. So it's kind of nice that it's 10 now, but most layovers sit around like 12 hours just in case there's delays, lots of things that could happen. So and it's usually like built in like a little bit of a buffer. So you usually, usually see minimum layovers to be around 12 hours. But the further you go, like if you're laying over in Europe, um, based on kind of like the schedule the airline is running, maybe there's only like one flight per day going to Rome from Miami or something like that, that your layover time is one you have you have to have a longer rest but also because there's only one flight operating per day so you kind of get like that full 24 hours before the next flight has to go back yeah. so it kind of depends on the sequence of how the the flight schedule is just like as a company-wide thing and um but then the rest i would say most layovers around or not, they all vary but definitely doesn't really go under 12 these days Nice. Ali, you keep bringing up Rome. Are you going there soon? Are you, did you just get back from Rome? Is it your favorite city? What's going on here? I don't know why I keep bringing up Rome other than, it's, you know what it probably is? It's because it was my first trip that I worked on reserve that was an international trip. And I'm like still jazzed over it because it was so like, it was so shocking. Like I was like sitting at home and then I was like, oh, maybe I'll go like to this Nordstrom rack, go shopping, go here. I'm like walking around. And I'm like on the phone with my mom and I get a text that's like, oh, there's been a trip added to your um, added to your line. You're going to, you know, X, Y, Z, log in to see your where you're going. And I was like, oh, mom, I just got a trip. Let me see what it is. And I stopped in the middle of the Nordstrom Rack and I was like, I am going to Rome. And it's like still <laughs> something that I think of. Like, that's like kind of a fun thing on reserve is you never know where you're going to go and you get those cool trips when you're like, just kind of there. Anyway, so that's probably why I just keep bringing up Rome. Oh, no, no, let's, no let's plans talk more. Right now. <laughs> no, let's talk more about that experience. Um, because, you know, the way that you're describing it, you're already thinking about kind of the destination, the layover and the fun 
time you get to yourself, the free time you get to yourself in that city. When you tell me that story from the outside looking in, I'm thinking about how long you're going to have to work and, you know, serve people on that flight. But it sounds like you don't really remember the service part. You do remember getting the touchdown in Rome and exploring. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Definitely. So, well, first, when you get an assignment on reserve, you typically have like a two, in a base. I was based in Chicago at the time. We had a two hour call out. So when you get that notice, you have two hours to get to the airport. So I was like, I got to leave. I got to go pack up and go. And so it was kind of like really, really fast. And then all of a sudden you're like in the flight, you're working. And it's kind of like it just it just goes by really fast because I think you're so excited to go there, especially as someone that's like a new hire, which I still am considered a new hire as well. But like just going to Rome for the first time and like being really excited to be with your crew and all those things, I think it's just like, like everything becomes a blur until you land and you're like, okay, we have 24 hours, what can we do? And you just like do everything and you try not to sleep because you're like, I just want to see everything. And it's not like you like won't ever go back, but you're just kind of like so jazzed about being there that you're like, how much can we do in 24 hours on 30 minutes of sleep? <laughs> and Allie, are you given, uh, as far as I'm, cons- as far as I'm aware, you are given accommodations for that night paid for um, the the airline or agency that you work for? Do you also get a per diem for food or anything like that? Yes. So per diem is with every trip. So I think it's, I don't know what the exact number is, like maybe a dollar and 60 cents or something like that per hour, per hour you're away from base. So if you're on a four day trip and that's 24, 48, you know, like every hour you're getting, you're accruing that per diem. And then um, hotel is always paid for. And then our transportation to and from the, um, airport so you just have to like show up and then <laughs> like figure figure out what you want to do in your layover so you really do get paid paid to travel um in a lot of ways um talking about your crew and you know you just mentioned how you go out how how often do you work with the same crew and would you say you have friends now that are other crew members that you enjoy working with absolutely so it's very rare to work with the same crew i don't think i've ever in Mm. my life worked with the same exact crew, like the same four of us or anything. Every now and then you'll be like, oh, like I remember you from two years ago. We worked together that one trip to Tulsa and we like went out here and it's like, oh, I remember that. That was a great trip. And you kind of like have that moment. It's like, all right, on to the next. And then you like work your trip together. But I would say for the most part, your trips are kind of like completely new people every single time. So you're meeting each other for the first time every, every trip. And if it's like a three day trip, you work together for the full three days, but you're meeting at that like first leg. And um, and then as far as friends, absolutely. I've made so many flight attendant friends. We're kind of all spread out across New York, Charlotte, Chicago, Phoenix, LA. Everyone's kind of all over. But um, my friends here in Miami, I'm not newish or newer to Miami by about nine months, but I've made a lot of friends here since I've been here. And so we kind of want to, a few of our friends, we want a buddy vid, which is essentially just like opting in when we're bidding for our schedules or saying like, we want to fly every trip together. And then you can work with a friend, which is great. You could work even your whole crew. You can do the four of you. If it's most crews are like four people, you could bid the four of you. So every layover you have, it's all together. It's fair to say that when you signed on to be a flight attendant, you could have never predicted that COVID was about to take over. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the challenges going into COVID and how they affected you personally as a, um, you know, as a new flight attendant? Yeah, it was really wild. So COVID hit around nine months into being a flight attendant. So I was still on reserve. I was freshly off probation. And then there was all this talk about COVID happening and everyone stopped traveling and stay home. And I was like, oh my gosh, like my job is literally the opposite of, of that. And like, I have to travel and go home. Like, I wonder what's going to happen. So it was really wild to see how things started to unfold because it started, it was one day, everything was normal. And then the next day, the airports were ghost towns. Like everything just completely shut down. And I I was still flying and we were still working trips. I would definitely say as far as like the flights went, all the flights were cut in half. So if I was used to flying X amount of hours, I worked a higher time then. I would work like 80 hours on reserve. I all of a sudden started working 40 or it was barely meeting the minimum because all the flights were cut in half. 
And so that was like a really weird, weird time to be in. And then when I was in the airport, it was just completely empty. It was like lights were off in different areas. It felt like we were in like an apocalypse, like yeah. the Walking Dead sort of vibe. It was really, really weird. And um, then there was a furlough as well across the industry. So most flight attendants were furloughed for about, you could opt to take a leave, but most flight attendants were furloughed for about nine months, I would say. Including yeah, yourself. Nine. Yes. So it started, so COVID, that sort of like um, chaos, like the everything really shutting down was like that March 15th sort of time. Mm -hmm. And in April is when they, the companies were offering leaves. So they were offering leaves for up to six months. And I talked to my family and they were like, take a leave. You don't want to be flying during this time. Whether other people are traveling or not, take the leave. So I started taking leaves one by one. So I would opt in to take a leave for April. Then I opted to take a leave for May, then for June. So I started to just kind of like take personal leaves. And most flight attendants did because there wasn't a need for flight attendants. There weren't enough flights going out. So um, and it was kind of encouraged to take a leave if you could because if you did, there wouldn't have to be a furlough if we could just keep it to the bare mm -hmm. minimum. And eventually a furlough did happen. And it was around October of 2020. And then we were all brought back on the line in March of 2021. So roughly a full year later, I, I can't imagine, that, at least in your case, it doesn't sound like, you know, the intention for being a flight attendant was, attendant was financially motivated. But I'm sure for a lot of people, they do depend on, you know, the, the paycheck to, to live day to day. So I, I can't imagine how stressful it, it was during that time. And something else that's caught my mind is since then, there's been a rise in the amount of yearly accidents that have been shown towards uh, flight attendants. There was another stat from Politico that I read that from 2020 to 2021, the number of yearly accidents jumped from 1,000 to 6,000 in the United States alone. Can you talk to us a bit more from your perspective, how if that's affected you in any way, or if you know anyone that was affected in, in, in their experience of dealing with customers, obviously with all the mandates uh, and mask and that sort of thing. Yeah, like as in accidents, you mean like um, like incidents in flight where someone's not wanting to put their mask on, like things like that? Uh, yeah, or, you know, I mean, they've been as extreme as people, you know, you've seen the videos, people getting tied with duct tape. I'm not, you know, I don't <laughs> think that you were on one of those planes, but, you know, just the, I would say the animosity has grown towards flight attendants for something that they have no control over. You didn't make the mass mandate. Right. That that was definitely a tough thing to come back to because we had a, the majority of us had about a year off and then went back and the mandate was still in place. The mask mandate for I don't I can't even remember, but like it must have been like a year. Was it 2022? That it came, I like think it's, it's hard to even remember. I would say at least two years that I can remember it being uh, in place roughly. Yeah, so that must have been about a year then with with masks on in flight required in flight. And that was definitely tough because a bunch of like states and islands and different places are all very different with like what they wanted to do and not even from a political sense, although it did get a little political. And in, in some ways, um, a lot of people didn't want to wear them. And we were told, you know, like, they have to if they don't, they can't fly. It made other people uncomfortable around them if they weren't wearing a mask. So it was chaos having to, one, just focus on our daily operations of like getting the job done, making sure everything is safe and secure and focus on those priorities of the day to day. And then also have to go around and like babysit, yeah. <laughs> make sure everyone had a mask on. They're like, what did our job become? It just like doubled in work. What happened here? <laughs> uh, I want to talk about empathy. Um you know, there's because I think it really boils down to a lack of education and mostly empathy. And when I say lack of education, I, I just mean the anger is redirected at the wrong personnel. Like I said, you did not implement the mass mandate, but it's part of your job to enforce those rules. Um, what would you say some things what would you say are some things that passengers need to keep in mind when realizing that things aren't in your control delays? mandates and how can we help foster a more empathetic attitude towards flight attendants 
I think exactly like as you said I think just like being empathetic and like just remembering that when you hear like there is a delay or something it's no one's specific but it could be the weather it could be maintenance and maybe that is something that like and like maintenance isn't even necessarily like one particular person's fault things get wear and tear things need to be fixed it's better to fly on a safe plane that was fixed than a broken plane and maybe not get where you're gonna go so I think like thinking of it in that mindset of, um, you know, like, hopefully we're going to get where we need to go and it's going to be tonight. If not, it'll be tomorrow, but we're there safe. Like that's, I think a a positive way to think of it. But um, I think just like having compassion towards other people, whether it's like your fellow passengers that are also maybe delayed getting into their best friend's wedding or their work conference or something like that, that everybody has their own story. Everybody's trying to get somewhere and, or they're going home from somewhere and everyone has different things going on that um, you never know. So always treat people with respect, be kind, whether it's the flight attendants, your fellow passengers, the maintenance team, the pilots. And um, I think that that definitely makes flying a way more fun and enjoyable and nice environment. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> through those tough times. Definitely. And, and in that same political article, you know, I read that legislation was trying was being introduced to help train flight attendants to be equipped with more skills in case you get rowdy passengers. Have you seen any changes being implemented in how you deal with customers in the last, let's say, two years? So as far as it's so funny that you mentioned too about like the like self-defense sort of side of things, because that's something that we do do in training and in our initial qualification, but then also we go back and we train every year. And um, we go back to our, our hub and we, we um, are requalified. And so the self-defense is always a part of it, but it was funny kind of going back during that COVID time. And, you know, we we're kind of like, okay, now this stuff might actually need to be used <laughs> like on a day-to-day, like the self-defense thing, like just joking around it. But, um, but I forget the, what was the, ma- did I stray away from that? No, 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 you <laughs> did. did. I, so no, 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 because I guess I was thinking that you lack that training, but it sounds like you already go through that training. The only difference is that now you might actually have to use that where before it might have seemed like something kind of silly to go through. Right, exactly. There's like a little like dummy in training and you like practice like Taekwondo. Yeah, there's a there's a whole thing. Exactly. <laughs> there's a whole training section on it, which is fun. And you do it every year. That's hilarious. I, again, this good insider knowledge, I would have never guessed. Um, but now that we've talked about some of the more difficult parts about being a flight attendant i want to tell her i don't my goal is not to dissuade anyone to do this it's not an all doom and gloom scenario there are clearly some amazing perks you get to take advantage of can you tell us about some of them aside from the free travel yes definitely so there is the the free travel for yourself but then there's also free travel for Mm -hmm. any person of your choice so that could be a significant other, a brother, a best friend. I know anyone that you choose, you get that same sort of employee benefit to one other person of your choice. Your parents fly for a really discounted rate. It essentially comes out to being just like the taxes and then you get some buddy passes. So it's like, yeah, there's some really good travel benefits there. Um, And then kind of on that same tune of, of travel as well as a flight attendant and pilot, you also get to take extra jump seats. So if there's a flight that's super full, like let's say I'm trying to get from here to LA, but the flight's oversold by 20, but there's extra jump seats on the plane, I can be like, and I'm 30 on the list for getting getting a seat. I can say like, oh, I'll take the jump seat. I'll like volunteer and you can take the extra jump seat, which is only the cabin ones are only for the flight attendants and the flight deck ones are only for the pilots. So that's a really big bonus of being like that kind of differentiates airline employee and then like flight crew because that's a that's a big one it's kind of like the fallback on like whenever you're somewhere you're like at least i know i could take the jump seat i can get home and not be stranded for five days two quick follow-ups to that one uh the first one do people fight to be your buddy as in family versus partner absolutely my (laughs) brother and sister went right at it right when it right when i was like guys i think i'm gonna apply to be a flight attendant they were like me choose me as your person because they knew how it works because our aunt was, is in the industry and so um i kind of described i told them i was like my sister you can have it the first year my brother tyler you can have it the second year and i was like if i have a boyfriend at that point guys like i hope you enjoyed your years because i'm i'm gonna switch it over to him 
And so my sister had it the first year, my brother the second year. It was kind of a wash because it was during COVID. So he had it for like a year and nine months. I was like, I feel too guilty taking it from you. Couldn't use it at all. So he had it for almost two years. And then now my boyfriend has it. Well, congrats to him winning the lottery with the flights. Uh, (laughs) Does it work in the way that they have to be traveling with you to take advantage of that benefit? For for example, let's say your brother. Okay, so if your brother's, let's say, in Austin and you're in Miami and you want to get to Belize, you can utilize that buddy pass. Absolutely. He can use it in any way that he wants to. So he can like come here and visit me. We could meet in Montana. We could meet in Rome to bring up Rome (laughs) again. (laughs) We can meet in Rome. Very cool. Very, very cool. I had no idea. Um, So what's been your favorite travel experience that arose from you being a flight attendant outside of Rome? Outside of Rome. I would say another great experience. It's it's a similar, um, similar like the Rome one, but actually a little even crazier. It was actually a trip to Athens when I was Chicago based. I was sitting on airport standby, which is something that it's a very like You do it for your first few years as a new hire, but when you're on reserve, you have to sit standby twice per month, which essentially is just sitting in the airport for six hour periods and you just wait to get called. So like you sit there and like you watch your movies, you talk with your friends, you eat lunch, whatever you wanna do. But when you get a call, it's like, instead of being home and like get to the airport in two hours, it's a, hey, go to gate K-12 and be there in three and a half minutes, like that sort of thing. So you're like, on standby and that's for if any crews go illegal someone's running late something happened with someone didn't bring their passport which ah, that's so a rare one you do have staff that's ready on standby in case i didn't know that i always thought they had to call someone from home to rush over but okay good to know yeah like sitting in the airport so we have crew rooms where pretty much at all times unless it's like after midnight that's yeah. like usually when the last one goes home um is just crews ready to go. You've got your bags packed for anything and anywhere. You could be going for however long. And so in, in this instance, that's a really memorable one was I was sitting on standby, based in Chicago, I was talking to a friend. We're sitting there, I think we were eating lunch and then I get it, or there was actually like a sound speaker that went off and it was like, flight attendant case, please call crew scheduling. Flight attendant case, please call crew scheduling. And I was like, well, it's weird they didn't call my phone, but okay, let me call. And I'm like, hi, I just heard the message, whatever. Like, did I get a trip? And they're like, oh yeah, um, you're going to Athens. And I was like, Athens, Georgia? A- Athens- which is important, an what? important <laughs> distinction, yeah. yeah. I was like, Wait, which, which Athens? Like, cause this could really affect my, my reaction right now. And they were like, oh yeah, no, you're going to Athens, Greece. You're gonna be the number six flight attendant and the flight departs in 35 minutes. So go to the gate right now. And I was like, wait, oh my gosh, this is so wild. And it turned out it was actually, it was related to like a COVID situation, um, which it was during around that time where you needed to be tested to go in. But it was kind of like ambiguous on whether as flight attendants, you needed to either one, you had to be vaccinated or you needed to just have been tested the day before. And like within that 24 hour period. And then I guess there was like a crew that went illegal and something, something, someone's time ran out in some way. So there were two positions that opened. So then two flight attendants, me being one of them from standby, we were called onto the trip. And it was funny because we actually went to the gate and then we were told like, oh no, actually everything's fine. Go back to standby. You're okay. And I was like, we were both like, no, that could have been so so deflating. Yeah. I know. And we were like, oh my gosh. And I was texting my family, like, I can't make dinner tonight, guys. I'm going to Greece. Like, this is happening. And they're like, oh my God. So then I like go back to standby and everyone that was sitting there, they're like, oh my gosh, you're not going. Cause I was like, I'm going, guys. It was like adorable. It was like, like, when, I don't know. It could have been like a movie scene. Oh and, um, exactly. And then I like came back and they're like, no, what happened when they saw me walk back? I both walk back in. And I'm like, oh, I guess it like fixed out, whatever. And then 20 minutes later, we get another call. And it's like, okay, never mind. You actually are going. Go back to the gate, whatever. We just need to verify your vaccination card and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, don't play with me. Am yeah. I actually going? <laughs> I can't have my heart broken for a second time. And lo and behold, we ended up going and I had a really great time. It was really fun. 
Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out for you. And yeah, I mean, you even you just saying that story, like I was deflated for you. I actually thought the story was going to end and you didn't actually get get to go. But I love Greece. I love Athens. I love the food. So hopefully you enjoyed some of that over there. It was super fun. And the first thing I thought was like, I hope I have things that are like packed for Greece. Cause I was like, I don't remember what I packed. <laughs> like, do I just have activewear in my bag? Like I was never expecting to go to Greece when I woke up that day. So I was like, just like, oh my God, I don't remember what I packed, but I guess I could buy something if I need. In general, is it fair to say you have to pack for summer and winter weather all in once? And Definitely. You kind of have to have, you have to be packed for any sort of terrain. And sometimes it's one day. Sometimes it's four days, so you kind of just have to, and sometimes if it's a standby situation, sometimes you just go home at the end of the day and you're like, well, I didn't even open my suitcase and I'm packed for four days in summer and winter. So you just got to have to be prepared for anything and everything at all times. The funnest thing about this conversation has been the spontaneity of the job, right? You you really just have no idea how long you're gone and where you're going to. That's that's very cool. Uh, for For anyone that wants to get into this line of work, what would you caution them to consider, both the good and the bad? I think something that comes up a lot, a question that someone asked me is about time at home and spending time with family, having kids, having a puppy, things like that. So um, something I would caution against is it's it's tough your first year because especially your first year, it, it can be tough building a routine, you know, forever because your schedule is always changing. It gets easier with time. But I would say especially your first few years, it's tough to make plans. So that's a really tough one. You're going to miss holidays. You're not really going to be able to spend Christmas at home, Thanksgiving. That's just like a given. Like you you will be working 100% on those holidays. And then um, just because you're like on the reserve period, you're given your 12 days off and everything else is kind of a wash. It's hard to make plans in the sense of like, yes, I can make this birthday dinner. Or, you know, if you have a new puppy, having someone to watch your puppy when you're like, sorry, I have to be at the airport in two hours. Can you help me like right now or something like that? Um, that's, that's a tough part for sure. That does sound tough. Never mind about what I said about this job being totally awesome. I can't <laughs> leave my dog that long. I know. No, I don't just... have a puppy, but I really want one. And it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So I, I can't do it right now because I wouldn't be able to like, like Correct. feel you... like I'm fully in it. Right. You're being responsible about it is what you're saying. Absolutely. But hopefully in the next year, two years, three years, we'll get a puppy into the family. Good. Uh, Allie, this conversation has been so insightful and interesting. Um, but before we let you go, I want to talk a little bit more about Uppercase Media and its mission. What services do you provide your clients? Yeah, so we are a full service social media marketing agency specializing in brands and health and wellness and food and bev. And we do anything and everything you can think of with social media. So content creation, influencer marketing, paid social, community building, the full nine yards, anything you can think of. We do it and we love it. And we have a small but nimble team and I love it so much. I really enjoy doing both things because both are just insanely passion, insanely passionate, insanely passionate interests are both. <laughs> major interest. I'm very passionate about both. And so I'm really lucky to be able to do both every day. And, you know, before we wrap up, I do have a few rapid fire questions related to travel. We'd like to ask you, are you ready? Cool. I'm ready. Let's do it. Out of all the countries you've been to, what has been your favorite so far? My number one is Israel. I love Israel. Okay. That's my favorite. And I, I think it was, it was one of my first trips that I ever took like really, really far. So that one always sits really um, close to home for me. Close and home. a little birdie told me you got really sick on that trip too. I did. We might have to save that one for another podcast <laughs> episode. <laughs> Fair enough. Your favorite dish or cuisine from a country you visited? Ooh, the first one that comes to mind is this 12 course meal that a few friends and I did in Buenos Aires. It was insane. It was cool. Have you had the same experience? Yeah. It looked like you might my, have. my favorite experience, culinary experience, has also been in Buenos Aires. It was, I want to say, 10 courses. Wow. Do you remember the restaurant? Chila. 
Oh, okay. Mine, it was called El Bacchiano, and we, we did a wine pairing with it. Yeah, same. We had a glass of wine with every meal. Like, our table was full of wine glasses. They never took them away. I think it was for the vibe. So we have, like, pictures of us, like, sitting there with, like, we put all the wine glasses around one person. It looked like someone drank, like, 30 glasses of wine, and we're, like... It was so funny, but amazing experience. The food was amazing. Good. Uh, well, we share that same experience then. Uh, most underrated country you've been to? Most underrated country. I, so off the top of my head, I would say Ecuador. I don't know if it's underrated, but I think before I went, I didn't know too much about Ecuador, but I did a 10 day backpack, backpacking trip with some girlfriends some flight attendants a few years ago and had the most amazing time. I think my top two countries are Israel and Ecuador. I think those sit like side by side. There's so much, so much fun, but I think there was just so much to see in between the water and the mountains and man, I loved it there so much. Very original answers. Uh, favorite bev beverage you've had abroad, alcoholic or otherwise? Oh my gosh, this one. Okay, I've got a really good one for this. So it was in Tokyo and it was, it was actually before I was a flight attendant. I was there for my 22nd birthday and we found this cool like bar kind of lounge restaurant and it was called Sip and Guzzle. It had a kind of bar, it was a two story thing. The top when you walk in was a bar and it's kind of like where you go and just kind of have that bar experience. And then you get this like secret invite we found mm. out. If they're like, ooh, we like you, whatever, whatever, to get invited to go down this like speakeasy sort of staircase to this lounge area where it's like more like romantic vibes like it's a little like more dim you kind of open this gate and you're walked in and then it's like like actual like table seating and it was so so cool and down at the bottom when we got we were taking shots with the bartender it was my birthday it was just like just hit mid midnight they're like oh we want to invite you down to this like experience downstairs and this this drink called the tomato tree it was i don't even remember what it was it was like some sort of like tomato water or tomato juice with maybe like gin or something. I don't even remember, but it was delicious. And when I got back to LA where I was living at the time, I sent an email to the restaurant and I was like, can you please send me this recipe? And they were like, no, sorry, you have to come back. <laughs> I was like, dang. That, no, no shots to anyone that's ever answered that question before. That was a great story. <laughs> Very <laughs> cool experience. Um, and so last cool. one, the country you are most eager to visit. I really want to go to Portugal. I hear the best things about Portugal. It's like one of those spots that I feel like if you ask anyone, like, where's your favorite place you've ever, you've ever been? They always say somewhere in Portugal. So I'm like, I'm missing something. I got to get there ASAP. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, along the lines of what you said, it's, it's such a popular destination that we actually did an episode of why is everyone going to Portugal? And so we answer that question. You got to tune back to, to listen to that one. Um, oh but. Gosh. But Ali, I want to say thank you so much for being a guest on the Globetrotters. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you if they want to learn a little bit more about you and Uppercase Media? Yeah, absolutely. My personal Instagram, TikTok, any social media. I'm Ali Case One, A L L Y C A S E, and then the number one. Uppercase Media. We just have an Instagram. It's uppercase dot media on Instagram, and then uppercase dash media dot com for our website incredible and if you want to learn a little bit more about us you can visit us on our website at www.gtspodcast.com you can also find us on any streaming platform facebook or instagram at globetrotters podcast twitter at globetrot pod and we'll be back next week with another thrilling episode until next time